So first of all, thanks to everybody who's joining us, who's listening and watching uh, in our discussion about enforced uh, artist mobility, and I'll discuss that concept in a minute. But first, a thanks to On The Move. This is a, an event uh, of onthemove.org, a cultural mobility network, uh, which uh, comprises about 50 members, mostly organizations that give support, advice, and information to artists and cultural workers who wish to cross borders for professional artistic reasons. And they're located in about 20 countries. Uh, this issue has been discussed normally at the General Assembly, uh, annually at the On The Move meetings. Uh, but for obvious reasons, we're doing it online now. I also want to thank our host, HowlRound, which is a free and open commons. It's a platform for theater makers worldwide. And it has hosts articles and discussions and live streaming. This is the 181st uh, live stream that they've uh, hosted since the COVID uh, began this year. Uh, very, very warmly um, thanked and very warmly recommended to anyone who's interested in cross-border collaboration. My name is Marianne Dievlig, otherwise known as MA, and I will be the moderator. I'll introduce our guest speakers in a moment, uh, but first just to say that this session is shared live on the Facebook pages of, of course, HowlRound, On The Move, Tamizdat, and TransArtis. And any listeners can pose questions or write comments uh, we will get them in pretty much real time. And although this is a short session of only one hour, we might not be able to answer them or address them today, but we will do so by the 17th of June. We'll also upload any interesting documentation that you might uh, find useful on HowlRound's Facebook page um, and web pages uh, before the 17th of June. So, our topic today is enforced mobility. What the heck does that mean? We all know that over the last few decades, there have been many more opportunities for artists to, and cultural workers to move from one country to another, to exchange, take up an artist's residency, co-create, uh, go to an exhibition or a film festival, um, learn or just present their work or meet other people in a network meeting. But what about artists whose mobility is not quite as voluntary. That is to say, it's due to certain constraints. Could be persecution due to their artwork or armed conflict, censorship, something that actually makes it difficult for them to stay in their country uh, and to make their work and sometimes even to survive. We call them artists at risk. They are at risk due to their work. Uh, all of the organizations here provide support to these artists as well as to other artists in terms of giving them advice, giving them legal advice, um, supporting their work in many different ways. And we've chosen four organizations because they are complementary uh, in the way that they work. Now our context is COVID-19, the virus that struck us all and that's curtailed us all and locked us all down. Um, all the health issues, economic issues, bureaucratic issues around it, not to mention the increased potential for artists who may be seriously in danger if they dare to criticize their government's reaction to the virus. And we also have to acknowledge the amazing political movements uh, which have been springing up globally uh, and making a call against systemic racism that also could bring an artist expression into some kind of danger. So we envisaged this discussion a long time ago at an ITM, at an OTM General Assembly uh, that would have taken place in Finland under the auspices of the Nordic Culture Point. Um, when COVID arrived, we said to ourselves, we have to go back to basics. Nothing of what we were thinking makes sense at the moment. Everything that's been happening, people who are working with artists who are amongst the most vulnerable have found themselves humbled, have found new questions that they have to ask themselves, new ways that they have to work. Uh, so we said, okay, let's just have a very intimate public discussion. What keeps you awake at night? What are you concerned about? What are you learning? 
How are you reacting on your feet? What about the people, the artists that you're working with? So I, we will go around for one or two rounds and just ask people to uh, explain uh, how this is affecting their life. First, I'd like to uh, invite Elizabeth Dubik, who's the program director of ICORN, International Cities of Refuge Network, uh, about 70 cities uh, all in the world, mostly in the global north, but certainly expanding over the last few years to Africa and the Americas. These are cities, municipalities who open their apartments to writers and artists who need uh, the support temporarily. Elizabeth. Thank you, Marianne. I'm, first, I'd like to say I'm very happy to be here. I'm very sorry we couldn't have met in Helsinki uh, almost a month ago, as we should have. But um, uh, I hope that this discussion will be just as uh, interesting and uh, that we can learn something from each other. I just want to say a few words about what ICORN does. You said a few, uh, Marianne. Our vision is improved conditions for freedom of expression worldwide. And we do that through establishing safe residencies where the artists can live and work and express themselves free, freely for up to two years. So it's long term, but temporary residencies. Um, they're mainly provided by the residencies by cities and municipalities, but there's also universities and organizations who work with literature and the arts who uh, host our, our residents. And we invite artists, writers, journalists, bloggers, filmmakers, cartoonists, and so on, who are persecuted, and I mean individually targeted because of their work, to apply for a residency in our network. So we're not, um, we're not uh, in touch with so many who are fleeing countries because of what's going on around them. It's always an individual choice for them. And they come from all over the world where freedom of expression is under pressure. And more than 60% of those who apply for a residency with ICON have already left their country. I think that's quite important when we to know when we uh, when I continue now. And when I talk about the people who have been in in now that we see the how the pandemic has on the measures that we try to or has been in in place in different countries um, to fight the pandemic. Um, I can say that there is like three categories that we, I would say that we work with. One are those who are the artists who are already in a residency. And I won't speak so much for them, but they have, uh, I mean, obviously they can't leave the residency. They can't go back. They worry for their families. Uh, what are they going to do? They can't find work where they are, but, but they are basically in a safer place um, than they were before. Then you have those, um, uh, who have been invited somewhere and who got stuck. They have not been able to travel. They might not have been, uh, got their residency permit uh, ready, but at least they have an invitation to go somewhere. And then you have all the others who have in, uh, applied for a residency with us, um, but where we have not yet, yet found a safe space. And that all those together, it's several hundred people that we keep in touch with um, on a regular basis. So the situation now is that the artists who we work with are totally stuck wherever they are. They have no work, they have no income. I would say that their options have been reduced to zero because of the pandemic. Um, it's really difficult in the first place to get any remuneration for your artistic work when you are running from persecution and threats. So you often live on whatever income um, you can get from local jobs or necessary and not necessarily formal employment, of course, but mainly in the informal sector and with no security. And these jobs have disappeared or you cannot leave your house to go and perform your job. So so people are totally, um, many people tell us that they are totally without any income. And there's also many who tell us that they have very poor access to health services. And if you have your family with you, that's of course an extra reason to worry. And the being in lockdown, people tell us, is like a double-edged sword. Um, one, on one hand, there is the feeling of safety, not having to go out of your house into something that can be a hostile environment if you're, if you're not in your own um, community. But at the same time, uh, being locked up at home makes you feel like a sitting duck. You're an easy target for those who want to harm you, to expel you from the country, uh, or in other ways, um, uh, get to you. So far, it seems that the fear of such repercussions is much more a problem 
than people actually being targeted. Um, but we have heard of attacks and unwanted incidents, and we should not underestimate the impact that living in this constant fear has on people either. So it's a serious situation. And um, for the artists that we are in touch with, the lack of money, the lack of access to services, the uncertainty and fear, it comes on top of many people's already long-term stress and anxiety from being under threat. Um, if you don't really flee unless you feel under a great deal of pressure. And we see that many struggle now with um, increasingly psychosocial issues and that their well-being is deteriorating. And some of this may, all, um, may of course be helped by improving their financial situation a little bit and even sending some small amounts of money might help. But the longer situation, the longer it lasts, I fear, the longer it will take to mend the wounds I'll, and of course, I'll, and of course, the uh, even if a, an artist has been or a writer has been uh, granted permission to have a, a residency in your network, with the lockdown, they can't get to it. Mm. Yeah, and you ask what keeps me awake at night and concerning the situation. I, I'm luckily I've I haven't lost any sleep. I'm maybe maybe I'm just too, uh, you know, I, I'm too much of an optimist for that. Um, because we work very systematically with migration authorities and in the countries where we have um, residencies, we are already in touch with most of these and they are quite helpful um, and keep working in many countries. Um, not the sh We don't work with short term visas. They have, of course, totally that service has totally shut down. But for the longer term residency permits, uh, the migration boards are still uh, working and they have told us in many countries that they will process this. Now, the, of course, there is an added uh, difficulty of getting to an embassy or getting to an office to hand in your application. So there's this bureaucratic and practical issues um, like that. But but we keep working and processing these uh, invitations um, in the hope that this will uh, open up soon. We have also thank a small, you. sorry. Yeah, I'll come back yeah, to whatever I, else yeah. with you. Yeah. I would like to thank you. I also like to use that to echo something that I know Benedict uh, Alio has been doing uh, with uh, in terms of visas in, in France. Um, Benedict Alio, she's the director of La Cité Internationale des Arts in Paris, a very uh, large uh, uh, group of, of studio uh, apartments for artists uh, to take up residencies, 320 places, 135 French and international organizations, institutions, and foundations work with you in order to make these residencies available. Uh, and artists are coming from a range of different disciplines. Not all of them would be persecuted, but some apartments are. Benedict, what have you learned? What are you learning? And I know that you have some, uh, especially uh, diplomatic experience that uh, echoes what uh, Elizabeth has said. Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, to be with you all, um, uh, even in video. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, in the tradition of welcoming and of hospitality and of welcoming uh, artists from all over the world. Goes back at Cité Internationale des Arts. Um, goes back to its creation and the founders who really thought that uh, in a post World War Two world, one needed to have a place where every Everybody, every artist from all practices should be should be welcomed. And uh, on that basis, um, before actually uh, becoming partners with Icon uh, in the early 2010s, the um, the thing was to uh, was uh, was that Cité provided space, um, provided accommodation informally for refugees and exiles, and it started with uh, exiles from Chile, Argentina, South America in the 70s. So. I think that's that sense of, and that, I think that's a shared, uh, a shared, um, a shared thing of shared feature that we have all of us is about hospitality and solidarity uh, has has now been uh, quite exposed with uh, with uh, well the recent years, but also with COVID nineteen, where uh, the enforced mobility also uh, touches. I mean different kinds of community of artists. And, uh, and to say the least, what was really striking for us and what put us actually at the beginning in this, at the beginning of the lockdown in a state of uh, 
stupor. It's like we really were stopped short was the, the fact that um, even though some artists who, uh, uh, who had actually had come to Paris to be able to develop their practice, but uh, who were planning to go back home, haven't been able yet to go back home. And uh, they've been, uh, uh, well, uh, in enforced mobility and, and, and forced to stay in Paris at Cité uh, for now three months. And we know that for some of these uh, uh, artists, the, the time is going also to be quite long before um, they can go back home. So there's a, uh, what, uh, what uh, also, there are two things about this. There's, a, I think, about the crisis, this huge crisis that has just begun. This, the one that we're talking about, and it's just the beginning, it's about also the fact that everybody, um, in different ways, but everybody in the artistic community has become extremely vulnerable. And it's been, <clears throat> it's been a race, it's been, a, um, that's a French translation, but it's been quite a, yeah, a race to actually fundraise so that the artist also could get some funding so that they could, uh, well, they could attend to themselves, to their lives, to their families when they come with a family and, uh, and have uh, still benefit from a safe, uh, a safe place, uh, a place where they, they could uh, feel at least protection or where they would be, they would find a little bit of stability. But so we had to fundraise that. And, uh, and it's, it's also, I think, um, we're pointing towards uh, uh, with the fact that international mobility has come to a stop, at least for a while, is, um, yes, an increasing worry about those who have stayed behind and who are expected to come. I'm talking about then people who come from countries where they cannot necessarily practice their art for many reasons, where they cannot uh, benefit from freedom of expression, etc., etc. And there were quite a number of them that we were uh, uh, expecting. So there's a, a sense of, a, of um, well, of a utopia or utopian narrative of, you know, uh, uh, the world uh, uh, concentrated in a, in cité or the world of artists that can uh, interact uh, all practices included from all nationalities. That utopian narrative has, I won't say come to an end, but it has uh, come to a stop. And we need to also think about how we can um, rethink international mobility so that uh, the people who need to move out and need to move in can still do it. And otherwise rethink maybe on a more local scale how we can uh, make still the, um, the art scene or the possibilities, the opportunities for, from, for artists coming from the outside for them to, to benefit from that. And, uh, and so that's also one of the things that I wanted to point out was that uh, I was quite struck at the beginning of the lockdown <clears throat> and that, that beginning took quite a while was to, uh, there was a blind spot in the public policy. And the blind spot was that residency centers were not really in the picture. And I was, uh, I had to repeatedly uh, tell my uh, outside partners that no, we had not shut down and it was absolutely necessary and uh, essential that Cité should remain open for the artists to at least uh, have have some accommodation, but at least could continue or transform their project. But what was interesting was that there was a blind spot and that blind spot was confirmed also by the fact that when I asked and turned towards public authorities and said, listen, can I get some help, financial help, because some of the artists are stuck here. Um, can we get some, maybe some urgent funding for these guys? The blind spot is such that in France, there is no real space made for foreign artists who come on a temporary basis. Needless to say, for those who come without papers, it's even uh, you know, a harder challenge. And so that was an interesting one. And we're so trying to set up groups so that we can articulate that. And at the same time, the private foundations and the private sector was far more reactive, I must say. But it's that blind spot, I, I think, tells also a lot about about the different kinds of artistic communities and how the, the struggle they go through because, uh, because, because, because there's simply, um, it, it, it tells a lot about the invisibility of, of creation or the invisibility of those working spaces uh, uh, in arts and culture.
Thank you, Benedict. And um, it's interesting to hear you talk about uh, La Cité as a blind spot or even a kind of a dead space, uh, according to some people. Maybe we'll have time later on to talk about the, uh, the amazing solidarity um, uh, activities and initiatives that have taken place just because there is this group, this ga these gangs, these wonderful energetic uh, artists who are, who are living with you. So we've had two places or two initiatives who are really there to welcome and to host artists and to support them. We're going to change now to two other kinds of organizations uh, who give advice, information, who intersect with their own country's legal systems uh, to look at the other side, the more bureaucratic but also essential sides of, of these questions. I'd like to pass first to Felix Soderman who is working for ITR Germany, the International Theatre Institute, and together with the IG BK, which is the German International Association of Visual Arts, they have something which is an uh, online portal, uh, also very active with other services, called Touring Artists, which give information, all kinds of visa information, bureaucratic information, not only to artists who are coming to Germany, but also artists who are moving out and touring to other places uh, and also with an eye towards the issues that are faced by the organizations that may invite them or host them and i and i have to say in germany there are very uh, there's some very wonderful um initiatives for what i think germans call newcomer artists um and i suppose touring artist is also one of them felix uh yeah Hello, everyone. Thank you for the uh, short introduction. Um, I wanted to add a few words um, regarding Turing Artists. Um, so Turing Artists was initially founded to um, support artists who, who travel or who, have, who are working abroad um, regarding um, legal issues. And uh, two or three years ago, we launched a new program, which was called um, International Artists Info Berlin. Um, which was aimed especially at artists uh, who came to Germany recently from uh, countries um, where they're not able to, to work um, uh, under given circumstances anymore. This can be um, due to censorship, this can do, be due to war, this can also be due to, to um, cuttings of, uh, of fundings. Um, so there's um, like different situations which we're dealing with and um, our program is basically consisting out of uh, three different parts. Um, we have this online portal where we try to um, give information about um, visa issues, um, about project funding, about how, where to find um, help, about contact points. Um, we have a help desk service, which is pretty much the, the physical form of the online portal where we try to go more into details um, with, um, with special problems and issues. Um, and people can come every time and get a um, um, free of charge um, consultancy. And uh, this year we also established a new um, networking format in order to, um, to create a, a more intense or more vibrant networks between uh, newcomer artists and um, artists who are already established uh, in, in Berlin or in Germany. Um, we are facing basically two problems right now uh, um, during the COVID pandemic. Um, the one is, um, is a bit related to that. Um, so depending on where you came from, um, your legal status can be very different. So let's say you, you're a refugee from Syria, then you will have a refugee status, which um, guarantees you having access to uh, social security having access to the labor market. Um, but there's only just a few countries where people can get this status, um, um, which is Syria, Eritrea, and um, some other countries, depending on your situation, if you were politically active, um, those sorts of things. Um, and then we have um, a lot of artists coming from countries with uh, very tough situations where it has been really tough to, to make art in the past years, like, um, Turkey, Brazil, Russia, um, but they don't go into this status. They, they um, applying for like regular visa, 
like freelance visa. And um, so these visa are um, depending on your actual income. So um, you have to make a business plan. You have to show that you will be able to live in Germany as a freelance artist uh, and make a living out of that. So um, what happened uh, during the pandemic was that um, a lot of artists were confronted with the situations of not being able to make money in the upcoming months. And then let's say you're here for your first year, you get a visa for, for one year and um, you have your, uh, your date for, for the extension. And um, so there was this fear about uh, what's going to happen if I can just show that I worked for five or six months. Um, that there was um, little communication about that uh, from, from the um, uh, interior ministry and also from, from the local migration offices. Um, but within the last couple of weeks, um, there was um, signs that um, it's most likely it's not going to affect the um, the visa extensions. Um, but you cannot be hundred percent sure about the actual handling because um, this is um, it uh, depends on the on the migration office um, in the different states, um, which leads to another problem. Um, which is that uh, Germany is a federal state and um, Germany has um, a lot of topics which just the, the, the actual country, like the state of Germany deals with. And there's a lot of um, topics which the, the, the smaller states, the so-called Bundesländer um, are dealing with. Um, and those are also the, those topics as, um, as for instance, culture and culture fundings. Um, so basically in every country, uh, in every state, there is a, um, a different way of dealing with the corona. There's different quarantine rules. There's different measures. Um, we have a liquidity aid for artists. Um, this is also different in every state. Um, the way of the migration offices handling um, those new situations is different in every state. So for us, it's really tough. Um, to get an overview, it's uh, it's more that we actually accepted we won't be able to to get an overview about the whole of Germany. We can just um, um, like have a look on on how it's done in Berlin, and um, so it's more important for us to find people in at each state who can give good advice and who we can trust on, so we can actually um, bring those artists to those um, to those people. Um, but there's also some positive effects of this federal system, which is um, that, for instance, um, migration offices are allowed to make decisions on their own in each state. And for instance, the, the Berlin migration office said for the first time that um, people who are here with a uh, visa for um, freelance, with a freelance artist visa, if you would say so, um, they have the right to apply for social security and uh, unemployment payment, which was not the case before. So um, this is the first time and um, it was communicated a bit after the first lockdown. So um, this, um, this gave some security, but then again, still people are not sure about what's going to happen next. Is, is this going to be a problem that I at some point um, were relying on, on, on social security? So there's, um, on the one hand, there, there's like some good initiatives and good, good ways of dealing and helping those people who are affected by the crisis. And uh, on the other hand, there is um, the problem about not having like the 100% the sure information. And um, so this, um, this leaves a lot of insecurity actually in the community. Thank you, Felix. Uh... I see um, Elizabeth nodding, so I think she also has some, some things later to say about uh, this proof of, of work uh, system. But that leads us very uh, easily on to Matthew Covey, who's the founder of Tamistat, uh, as well as a law firm called Covey Law. Tamistat is your nonprofit organization, uh, which assists international performing arts people to address problems presented by international borders and specifically US visa policies and procedures. And I know that in together with other law firms, as well as the people that you work with directly, 
you've taken quite a leading role in, in uh, challenging some of the weaknesses uh, in the US. Um, and in particular, it comes to mind the Trump Muslim travel ban, uh, but not only challenging them, but also working productively and, and positively to suggest a feasible solutions to them. And you've also, uh, in collaboration with others in New York, you've opened up an uh, artist residency for musicians. Matthew. Yeah, um, thank you, Marianne, and thank you all of you. It's, you know, as I'm listening to everybody else talking through their experiences, I'm kind of like crossing things off my list of things to talk about because um, a lot of what you're all experiencing are the same kinds of things that we're experiencing. So I'm gonna be pretty brief and just um, talk briefly about what we're doing in regards to all artists um, in this time of forced immobility, I think is sort of part of the topic right now. Um, and then I'll then uh, end with a, a couple thoughts or uh, reflections on our, our very small residency program that we run for displaced artists at risk. Um, in regards to artists in general, um, in this current context, because obviously a lot of the artists, the artists that we deal with um, range from pop stars to refugees. And along that continuum, of course, the notion of uh, displacement uh, is a question of definition to a certain extent. There are people who are in the US because, you know, for example, as the Brazilian uh, situation has deteriorated over the last few years, we've seen a massive increase of Brazilian musicians moving to New York. Um, they're not refugees. They are coming because they want to be there it's, and they're seeing their career situation as being stronger there than it was in, in Brazil. But that's a definitional question. And, and uh, so we've seen a big spike in immigration uh, in, in working with our Brazilian artists getting visas. Um, so when a crisis of immobility comes as we're experiencing now, um, as, a, as a lawyer, a lot of the work that we found ourselves doing, the casework that we're doing is trying to help people, rather than help people move around the planet, trying to help them not have to move around the planet. Um, so a lot of the work that we've been doing is helping artists figure out how to uh, remain, how to extend their status, how to uh, explore other options, become, you know, enroll in academic programs, um, move from profession, from employment visas to resident visas, and then move from residencies into employment and basically doing whatever is needed to try to figure out how to keep people um, from having to go where they can't go or where it'd be really unwise for them to go. Um, some of this work has been focused on advocating to the US government. Um, we've been in conversations with State Department and Homeland Security. You never know whether those work or not, but um, it, they seem to be having some effect. Um, the, the US government just before the COVID crisis created some new rules which make it very difficult and in some ways dangerous for foreign nationals in the US to access um, public support. Um, mechanisms like healthcare unemployment, um, which seemed nefarious at the time. And then when COVID came along, suddenly it seems potentially life-threatening for a lot of artists. So um, we've done a lot of work um, helping artists understand what the implications of those rule changes are and helping them strategize how to keep themselves out of trouble, how to not uh, risk their visa status in order to keep themselves fed or keep getting healthcare. Um, Another thing that we've ended up doing a lot at, at Thomas Dodd is we've, we've conceptualized our work always as artist mobility. Um, but now that artists aren't moving, um, we're increasingly working in the realm of cultural mobility, thinking in terms of, well, if people can't move, can we still keep artists, art, artistic expression moving? Um, so we've long run a, a pro bono legal assistance hotline for immigration issues, which we have expanded um, in the last two months to incorporate healthcare law issues, but also live streaming uh, rights legalities uh, so that all the artists that we work with who now are moving their performances online and don't know what they need to be doing in terms of rights and royalties and clearances and all that, um, we're providing legal assistance with that. 
um, just as a way of helping them keep connected with their communities internationally and locally, um, but also increasingly toward finding ways to monetize their work online as a way of trying to have some sort of income in this time when, when it's very hard for performing artists to have income. Um, those are some of the, the main things that we've focused on. Uh, in regards specifically, so Marianne, as you mentioned, we started a, a residency program for musicians who were displaced um, because of the political content of their work. We started this last fall um, in collaboration with Artistic Freedom Initiative and the West Beth Artist Residency um, in New York. And we got through our first resident in the fall, which went really well. And then uh, Mai Khoi, a Vietnamese uh, composer and songwriter and activist uh, joined us in the winter. And it's been very interesting trying to figure out what to do with that residency, that specific resident, um, as the events have evolved. And as we've done that, the conversations amongst the, the different organizations, uh, folks at Artistic Freedom Initiative and West Beth and ourselves, they've really resolved, revolved around several different topics. And that really has to do with the different duties that we owe to different constituencies. Uh, the first of all, obviously, is our duty to Mike Hoy herself and the fact that she doesn't really have anywhere to go or it, moving, would, moving would be difficult and dangerous. Uh, we also have a duty to the West Beth Residency, which is a large building full of artists who are very connected with their community, but it's an insular group of people sharing elevators, sharing common spaces, and a lot of them are elderly. Um, so that is a group of people that we are, that there's a risk, inherent risk to that. Um, and there's the duty to the mission to continue to work with artists and help them. Um, and Initially, our thought was that because of our duty to my Koi and our duty to the West Beth, the last thing we needed to do was move anybody anywhere. Um, so we ended up extending her residency from three months to nine months, uh, which has been good because it's given her a lot more time to develop her work. Um, but interestingly, Marianne, as you mentioned, uh, in the wake of the political unrest that's roiling the world and certainly roiling New York right now. Um, that lined up very well with, as we're thinking about what to do after September, uh, where we're not really comfortable starting a visa process for getting an artist into the US when we don't know if embassies are even gonna be open. We don't know if we're comfortable bringing somebody from outside and putting them in the West Beth. Um, we're, we've been having discussions about how to change the focus of the residency for the duration of the COVID crisis to working with artists who are already in New York um, and trying to figure out how we can address their needs professionally in terms of mentorship, uh, but use the same structure that we were using for international artists, but focus them on artists, international artists who are already in residence, whether they have their own place to live or there's a way that we can transition them into West Beth, but not try to bring anyone to the US now. Um, that's thank kind you. of the thinking we're doing. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. And it's really interesting how we've, we've moved from the actual physical spaces where, where an artist can live and work if they're coming over for a temporary residency through to what do they need to do bureaucratically and legally through to actually how are they going to do their work? And I know that uh, this idea of strategizing uh, is very close to the work that all of you do, not only strategizing how you overcome the bureaucratic issues, but also how do you relate to an audience? We have one question so far from our listeners uh, who asks, how can these artists rebuild the trust with the audience um, offline or, or online projects? Now that ties in Personally, I have to say with some of the issues I've been exploring, which is if an artist doesn't have legal citizenship where they are living, uh, do they have do they express a different kind of citizenship? And some of you have been alluding to that through the work that they do, uh, uh, whether they're um, in a temporary residency or whether they are indeed living in the city legally or illegally, but through their artwork that brings out certain issues. I think that um, Benedict, you have a, a, a project uh, at La Cité, which uh, is work in progress every day. You have to unmute. 
sorry. Um, yeah, this is a project that we 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 developed uh, during COVID nineteen and the lockdown, and it's uh, it lacks total originality in the sense that it's digital. But uh, what we wanted to make sure is that to provide even on a, on a modest uh, uh, basis, fees for artists who would be keen to uh, uh, work on a project that we could put online. So you just have to go to our website and it's, uh, it's the chapter called Work in Progress Every Day. And it was also a way for us to assist them, uh, to assist, to interact, engage in a conversation while we were going through all of us this very strange and canny um, transition uh, to also try to engage in a conversation wherein the artist would be also maybe able to transform uh, his or her project or transform also his experience or her experience of, of the lockdown. Because um, we, we had, uh, during the lockdown, we still had 125 artists uh, on our two sites in Montmartre and in the Marais. And so, um, these guys were very careful, uh, but, uh, but also became uh, very, very lonely in the sense that they would be cut off from the networks and, and from outside as, as we were all. Uh... So work in progress every day was a very modest, humble response with our, our, our humble means, but to, to make sure that there would be um, some fees granted and there would be some a platform wherein one could interrogate question one's uh, way of dealing with his work or her work. Um, the, the, the other thing is, is uh, I think about, it's, it also was a, a way during the lockdown, but it was a way also to refocus some of the artists uh, that I saw last week were mentioning that to refocus on, on some stuff, but also to refocus on oneself. Uh, so that, that uh, ended up sometimes uh, to be quite difficult, but quite quite important. And uh, one of uh, one of the some of the artists, and I'm I'm thinking about musicians, but uh, could be of other practices. Actually, pointed out that uh, how difficult it was when you came from uh, well from far away, but you you came with your own practice, and uh, and for some of them who have decided or have had no choice but to stay in France to have to confront your practice with a professional community that does not necessarily uh, indulge in what you're performing. And that is also something that apart from the visas, the bureaucracy, which is just, um, is also something is very, uh, a very slow process, but it, it is also, I think, a process wherein one can feel very isolated or uh, in an enforced kind of immobility to quote Matthew is like, I'm stuck here and I don't know how to actually communicate my own creation process or my own practice, even though you've been very successful in your own uh, country. And just to, to get back to the uh, uh, um, bureaucratic side, I must point out that during the lockdown, we were remarkably assisted by the public authorities in providing visa extensions automatically uh, and papers even to people who had no papers uh, on a temporary basis yes but at least for an extension of three months or more whereas in usual times it's impossible to get in touch with them so I must say that COVID-19 has provided uh, some kind of communication which made it less stressful for at least the residents at Cité, wh wherever they came from, whatever was their visa condition or their paper condition, uh, that, that uh, uh, made them feel more, uh, I guess, less uh, stressed. Thank you. Let's get back to this idea of what the artist is, how is the artist relating to the people around them? Um, and I know that uh, in Germany, there's some very interesting examples. This is the Akademie der Künste, who, or, or I think, who runs a program, a preparation for like a first preparatory year for artists, newcomer artists who may then, if they succeed in that year, uh, go on to starting a normal arts foundation course. That's just one of them. Um, Elizabeth, I think that uh, in some of the Icorn cities, the artists are uh, encouraged to make projects with the local population, what, however they 
do that. You know, it might be, I don't know, workshops for children or it might, might be teaching at a university, what, what have you. Would either one of you like to comment uh, about that? What do, and are, is it only for their diaspora audiences or are they relating um, in a different way to general audiences? Um, I may just start on that. Um, um, yeah, th there's this uh, uh, university programs, which you mentioned. Um, this is actually, there's um, a foundation class at um, the Weissensee University, which um, is for that course. There is also um, a program from the Berlin Senate, um, and there's similar programs in, in other cities and in, in other states uh, within Germany, um, which um, brings um, like refugee artists or artists who come from, from countries with um, difficult situations um, together with um, very well established cultural institutions. Um, so they have the chance to, um, to work together for um, between eight and 12 months and um, to, um, to, to, yeah, to, to create an, an outcome, to create an output um, during that time. Um, and this program is running for, for three years and um, until now it has been like um, pretty successful and um, th there's a huge interest and um, they actually, they get the chance to, to work um, yeah, with the community of the um, of the culture institution or with the with the audience of the culture institution, and um, yeah, I think um, this is um, this, this this is a good program. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since you're still muted, Marianne, I'll just take the word and say that we have, uh, of course, we have in Icon over 70 cities that host artists. So each city will have their own program to um, make the interaction between the artists in residency and the local community. But since we have a lot of people who are very heavily targeted, not all can do that and can be public. So that's a tricky part of it. We have to always think of the security of the artist before first. Um, but I can men I mean, um, we, and we have all kinds of artists. There's uh, musicians who then play with other, uh, of course, locally and uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, all kinds of genres, um, but we also, I could mention two projects that we have been part of, one together with uh, with um, Reporters Without Borders in Sweden, and it's not for artists, it's for journalists, because journalists uh, have a very hard time uh, connecting in their new communities, and we have a lot of journalists on our program, um, and it's called Colleague to Colleague, so it, it involves uh, uh, local journalists who then uh, have a program together with the uh, resident uh, journalists to see how um, they can interact and how they can work uh, better in their new um, place. And the other one is uh, a small uh, or a growing project that we call uh, Ratatosk. It's for, for now it's a Nordic um, project. Um, and Ratatosk is a little squirrel that uh, runs up and down in Northern, Northern Norse mythology with messages. So this is a translation project where um, we uh, hook the writers up with, uh, uh, with translators and they work together um, in a special program that goes through and it then the, this is connected to festivals literature festivals around the uh, Scandinavian countries and it's been really successful and it's been uh, wonderful performances and readings and and uh, events through that and of course texts that then gets translated into the local languages thank you um uh, it's often the artist-led initiatives that uh, that are the most helpful or amongst the most helpful. Uh, and I, I noticed that um, we have another question. I'm not sure if this answers it, but often artists who are in these kind of residencies uh, find themselves in a position of, of feeling that they have to be just grateful, feeling that people think that they are victims, uh, feeling that people think that that's all they are. In fact, they're very deep and, and diverse uh, uh, people uh, uh, in our artistic work and in their personal life, what they have to offer. So uh, often uh, the artist-led uh, organizations uh, will approach the artists uh, who are newcomers on, a, on an artist-to-artist -artist basis, not necessarily 
in a matter of charity or, or we will help you poor things, but, but really respecting them. And I think in that sense, this question of uh, Benedict, uh, many artists who have come over to another country are trained in a different aesthetic. And that aesthetic is not trendy in the country where they land. And we're not necessarily even talking about the language that's spoken. We're talking about the language, the jargon in the arts community. We're talking about which curators uh, uh, want to prove them their you know, superiority by doing which kind of uh, artistic presentations. And we're also talking about filling in funding applications, which let's face it, is a different language altogether. Uh, Matthew, I think you wanted to say something. Um. Yeah, I, yes, I did. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, in terms of uh, going back to the question about building communities, um, building local communities, I think that that's um, something that became really clear to us very, very early on was that that the residency without a mentorship program didn't wasn't going to go anywhere, and that the key to this was finding a way to work with the artist before they started the residency to outline what kind of project they wanted to do so that we could line up specific individuals who could stay with them throughout the project and mentor them and help them develop those, develop their, I'm dating myself here, but develop their Rolodex, who's gonna be their, their team of people to work with on, on the ground and would continue to work with them even after the residency was over. I wanted to say one thing about reaching out to community. Um, a feel good moment that we had with my Koi was right in the thick of the lockdown in, in Manhattan. Um, she did a project with other musicians in the West Beth where they opened their windows along one wall, uh, one, one side of the building that they were all in residence and all in their windows performed together just to the street below. They were all separated from one another. Um, and it was really a gorgeous trio that they had going across the face of the building. Uh, uh, and got a lot of coverage from that because it, it was a kind of a lovely uh, moment of overcoming the limitations of the lockdown. I'll send a link if you want to see it. Thank you. Uh, we have another message, uh, particularly to Benedict, um, but I think it's uh, opening up a different question which we could talk about for a very long time, which is uh, the, the writer has said there's a difference between um, uh, digital viability and financial viability. And I, I know that a lot of <laughs> other artists who, who are just in their own countries are, are having to deal with that. Um, uh, Elizabeth, would you like to comment on Matthew? Yeah, not just on Matthew, but we're talking now. I mean, the discussion has gone a lot on to artists who are already in uh, Europe or in safe countries and how they integrate with uh, communities there. But I mean, what we see is that people who are haven't reached that far yet, who are still um, trying to find a safe place to keep working when they are under these harsh conditions, and especially what's happening now, um, they cannot do any uh, uh, or very little artistic work. So their portfolios are, are diminishing and, and uh, then when they are uh, looking into getting a residency and they haven't produced anything in maybe two, maybe three years, that becomes increasingly uh, difficult, of course, to find a residency that looks at what project are you going to do, what have you been doing and so on. So I think that's something that the um, communities that host artists, uh, especially uh, residencies that look at artistic marriage should keep in mind because um, it can dwindle your artistic uh, expression can dwindle while you are uh, in a difficult situation. Felix, would you like to say something? Um, yeah, I, I just, um, I have the, the like slight impression uh, within the past weeks um, that um, like usually like established cultural institutions, um, when they work with a newcomer artist, um, they are, um, let's say they, they are curious in a way that as like Benedict already said, um, there's a different aesthetic coming in. They don't know how to put that into their institutions. So um, sometimes working with the newcomers means that those projects are kind of side projects within the whole repertoire. And uh, what I, I kind of had a feeling in the past weeks that um, due to COVID-19, um, speaking for the theatres, um, the, the programs for the next season are going to be really packed because there's a lot of stuff which should have been done in the end of this season, which now 
jumps to the next season. So um, there's, there might be even less space for those artists um, than there was before. So um, this, this, um, like the, the the challenge would be to to get them out of this this niche position and uh, uh, bring them in a position where they could, um, um, yeah, where you give space to like a potential different aesthetic. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, um, and thank you to everybody. Uh, this was a teaser, I want to say to our listeners. Uh, we wanted to know if, how much interest there is uh, on this. I, I can see many different uh, issues that we've been discussing here could be uh, debated for even a much longer time. And I want to say that one of the reasons, one of the several reasons that we don't have the artists' own voices here is because this is so short and we've all felt that it was too short to give them uh, the respect that they would need um, and deserve to be able to speak about these issues for themselves. So if there's enough interest, On the Move and HowlRound might be willing to host uh, more series of discussions on this topic. And I just want to stress one thing right before we finish, um, which is that I don't think any of us are asking for special treatment uh, uh, for artists who find themselves in this situation and are um, experiencing a, a residency abroad, a temporary residency abroad. I think all that we're arguing for is that they ha there's an equal playing field, that they have within reason the same kind of opportunities uh, that artists would have uh, who live and work in the same country for all their lives. So we've only got like one minute left. I want to thank everybody again for your time. Uh, I would love to carry on and speak uh, about this more. Uh, let's see what the listeners say and uh, thank you to everybody. <laughs>